So good morning, good afternoon, good evening everyone. This is Dan and this is part of my new YouTube channel about drawing together, part of the Napkin Academy where I like to get someone who I know and, and respect on the line with me and instead of just talking together we will draw a picture together and I want to introduce a friend that I've known for a really really long time. This is Dr. Tony Jones. Tony and I have worked together just over 20 years at this point. Um, we both worked together for the same consulting company back in New York. Tony was head of the healthcare practice. Tony in large part had that position because he's an MD from Johns Hopkins and one of the smartest people I've ever worked with on matters of science and healthcare. And Tony, among other things, you were the uh, head of global marketing for Philips Healthcare or very close to that. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Close enough. For, for and, one, of, one of the three big divisions. Very so, good. To, to be fair, I wasn't the only one. <laughs> you did something with Reuters a long time ago. What was that about? What were you doing at Reuters? Yeah, that was uh, back in the, the early days of the internet, where we just uh, we were the first group to um, basically syndicate daily healthcare news uh, through the internet. So back, I'd say for probably 10, 15 years from the mid 90s, if you saw a healthcare article uh, anywhere on the web, whether it was the AMA or any other search engine, that said Reuters News that was coming out of our group. Cool. Um, very, very nice little business. Yeah, and, and powerful for what we see now today yeah. with news aggregation some years later. And then you've been doing something interesting since you left Philips. What have you been working on these last couple of years? Yeah, so one, one of the problems that I think healthcare suffers from and really has suffered for decades now is just... Uh, Everything we ask patients to do in order for the system to work gets harder and harder each year. Uh, and so when patients struggle, it shows up as poor compliance. And people in the healthcare industry will often sort of go, oh, well, that patient's not compliant without acknowledging how much we're asking them to do and how much more we ask them to do year over year. Um, so what we really focused on is how do you make healthcare compliance easier for patients and caregivers? Now, recognizing that typically health management is not just the pursuit of the patient, but it's, a, it's actually something that uh, the whole family gets pulled into. Yeah. So what we've done is really just say, take the information that's already out there, reorganize it in a way that corresponds to the way a patient really experiences health, meaning it's more of a project plan. So don't don't teach me everything that I need to know or try to cram, you know, a year's worth of information into my head as you're discharging me from the hospital. Tell me what I need to do today. Think more action oriented based on where I am in my timeline. Am I pre-op? Am I post-op? Am I months away from something versus a week leading up to it. Then the other part that we added was the, um, the dimension of voice. So we actually use Amazon Alexa ah. as our primary interface to just say, how do you make it easier? And yeah, the, the reality is for a lot of people, you know, whether you're talking about a laptop, a desktop, or an app, the computer is just not a great interface. Uh, we often don't think about it for an older population. Um, you know, that just becomes a major barrier for a lot of people if you didn't grow up with that technology. Uh, it's also something that you see one of the populations that struggles most with computers are, um, are older men. And the primary reason being most men of a certain age never learn how to touch type. So as soon as you put a keyboard in front of them, they withdraw. Ah. So voice is a really nice way to reach populations that we have struggled to reach before. And oddly enough, those are the same populations that are having healthcare issues. So it's a good fit. So that, that's what we do. And so you've got a startup called Frontiv that yes. is focused on developing and deploying this technology using, among other things, Amazon, Alexa. And yes. um, it's pretty cool. So Thank you. Yeah, I think it's it's fascinating what you're doing. And I know that this idea of starting up your own company 
Hey, well, it's something you and I've been talking about for at least 15 wow. of the 20 years that we work together. So yeah. I, I'm very happy that it's moving ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, we're, we're, we're doing well. We uh, did our first deployment last year. We're now working on our second deployment. Uh, and the market reaction has been good. Patient feedback has been very good. Uh, and so I, I'm encouraged. In spite of everything that's going on right now, I think we are addressing a, a real pain point in the industry uh, from a number of dimensions. So I'm, I'm pleased with that. Which, which, Tony, is a perfect segue into what I wanted to talk about with you today. And we'll see where this goes in terms of what you might want to talk about with me. I'm just showing on my screen some notes. Tony and I did a prep call a week ago or so thinking because originally we were going to do this recording to your point about healthcare and we're in a weird place right now because of COVID um, that the thought was, hey, I want to get Tony on the phone because you know a lot about healthcare. In fact, Tony, you and I were the guys who put together the healthcare napkin series that's got almost 5 million views and that was almost a decade ago. And so I thought, well, here we are later. You know a lot about healthcare. Uh, COVID is doing whatever COVID's doing. We're kind of at the end of the beginning game now, I suppose. And I wanted to talk with you about what we might want to look for is just people who are interested in our own healthcare in the world, what might be coming. And then 10 days ago or so, uh, George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis. And probably most people have seen that video or certainly know uh, exactly what I'm talking about. And so Tony and I started to have a different conversation because this is something we've known each other a long time, but we've never talked about. And you might notice that uh, I'm a white guy and Tony's a black guy. And in the 20 years that we have been friends and colleagues, Tony, we've talked about Star Wars. We've talked about sci-fi. We've talked about movies, conversations about travel and things. And I don't remember us ever really talking about the fact that we're of different races. And I thought, I'd like to have that conversation, what it might mean, especially in light of what is happening with an outcome of George Floyd out in the world. And your perspective, which I'm pretty sure is going to be different than mine, just by virtue of who we each are. Sure. Um, sure. So that's kind of the preamble. The conversation's going to go wherever it goes. And what we thought we might do as a starting point, when we were talking last time, Tony and I, we came up with this idea, if you can kind of take as an analogy racism as a cancer and that's a term that we didn't make up that's been out there for a long time well yes. Tony one thing that you do know how to do from your experience is you know about the steps of helping someone deal with cancer yep. so given that you put together this kind of timeline as it relates to a medical professional helping someone through cancer what is your thinking about how we might start with this and let it become the conversation about George Floyd, our racial differences? What does that mean? We'll draw, we'll take notes. How do you want to go? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, the first thing I think is probably useful is to just sort of set up the metaphor and just sort of help people understand how those two are related and, and, and why it matters to have a metaphor. But yeah, I, I think the the most important thing is to sort of understand why why is a metaphor useful, and then why this one. Racism is one of those topics that it's almost impossible to get your arms around just because of the magnitude of it and the impact and the baggage that comes with it. That everybody, you know, we we all bring our life experiences or or the lack thereof to that topic. And so a metaphor using something that more people are familiar with is nothing more than an on-ramp mm. to get to a conversation and give you a way of breaking it up into something that's not so big. So you can actually start thinking about what am I trying to do if there's a problem I am trying to solve? How do I start to break that down into bite-sized pieces or a timeline so I know where I am? Otherwise, it's just too big and it's too nebulous. And you just sort of go, well, I don't know what to do with that. So you do nothing. And that's true, I think, for, for all of us. Uh, so with that being said, 
when when I think about what makes uh, late stage cancer in particular a good uh, proxy or metaphor for systemic racism, there there are a few things that come to mind. So I'm I'm just going to kind of start start doodling. First one is really just it's deadly. You know, both both of them are both they're deadly, they're scary, and I think we struggle with that. Because of that, we don't like to talk about them, you know, because of those two factors. And when you don't talk about it, you don't solve it. So you don't even start breaking it apart. And, you know, so it's scary because of that. We don't talk. <laughs> we basically say, this is something I, I might even see it, I might not, but it's unspoken and I just don't want to talk about it. So cancer does that, racism does that as well. Second thing that I think is worth talking about is when you talk about systemic anything, and again, late stage cancer is usually something that is metastasized. So it's gone from wherever it started, whether it's a lung or a kidney or a GI tract, and now it has spread throughout the body. So a surgical option is no longer really there. So you're really saying, okay, this is something that is really everywhere, you know, in the person's body. It's not just up here. It's not just there. It's not there. It's really attacking everywhere, which gets to the point of, you know, you hear people say, well, it's a few bad apples. And so, you know, it's isolated. It's limited. We can really focus in on it. And by the time it's reached this stage, it's so far beyond that. Uh, so you have to acknowledge it for what it is and just say, hey, this is a big problem. I do love the metaphor, and I really appreciate you introducing this because it does make it possible to talk about things that otherwise are tense. So an example of this might be here I am in lovely San Francisco, very politically correct San Francisco. We don't have racism here. We're San Francisco. We're high, We're woke. So for us, we might say, oh, this is a problem in the South or this is a problem in Florida, or this is a problem in Louisiana, or this might be a problem in, De in, in Detroit. That might be, to stretch the analogy, the equivalent of saying, I've got cancer and it's in my liver. Yeah. It's over there. Yeah. I don't have to worry about it. Not my problem. Right. Okay. Right. And, you know, again, I, I think the, the thing that, exactly to your point, the thing you have to remember as, as a nation, as a planet, we are part of a... a a system. And if any part of that system is failing, we're all performing or benefiting or hurting. We're not doing nearly as well as we could do because something's not working right. And that something will now spill over into something else. And so it may not have started where you are. It may not be as obvious, but it's there. You just kind of have to accept. You may not see it, but it's there. The other part that I think everybody can probably relate to is when you start moving into the treatment, the treatment for cancer is brutal. And, you know, when, you, you know, when you're talking about radiation, chemotherapy, surgery, combination of the three, it's just, it, you know, it, it's a nasty reality. And what, what's a good metaphor or image for that? I mean, chemotherapy, for those of us who are only aware of it as a term, what are you trying to do in chemotherapy? What makes yeah, it I mean, so the, nasty? The, the thing about chemo is you know, you're basically saying, I'm going to kill the cancer cells, but I'm going to use poison to do it. And so I'm effectively trying to find a balance to say, I'm going to give you enough poison to kill the bad cells. But in the process of doing that, I'm going to kill some good ones too. And I'm trying to titrate that to effectively not kill the entire system, but inflict enough damage on the bad cells to get rid of them. And it's sort of systemically, when you think about you know something like racism, if we think there's a way to address racism, I'm not even going to use the word solve, but if we think there's a way to address it without going through some discomfort and pain, we're fooling ourselves. 
And wrapping your head around that reality is, I think, one of the things that has kept us from making progress for decades, if not longer. There's a lot of willingness to say and acknowledge racism's bad, but when you start talking about solutions, as soon as there's some discomfort, there's a withdrawal, which is normal. That's a normal reaction. You have discomfort, you pull back. You've got to prep yourself. I mean, we've talked about this before. One of the most important things that happens in that doctor-patient relationship when somebody gets diagnosed with cancer is the conversation that you have with your physician uh, leading up to the treatment where they are mentally preparing you for what is about to happen. So you can now start mentally getting yourself prepared for my hair is going to fall out. My appetite is going to go. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to look horrible. I'm going to feel even worse. You've got to wrap your head around that. Nobody likes it. That's not a, it's not a question of convincing yourself to like it. It's simply a matter of saying, how do I mentally prepare for it? So when it happens, I'm not surprised. Mm -hmm. And same thing here, and which I think is true of anything that you're trying to do that's difficult, is you can't withdraw from the pain. If you're trying to run a marathon, it's going to hurt. I've never known anybody to run a marathon who didn't say it hurt. That's part of it. So similar thing here. And then I think the last part is, in a lot of cases, you don't really cure it where you don't necessarily know if you've ever gotten rid of it completely. Uh, you're really trying to keep it down to a level that is manageable. And that's kind of the, you know, with a lot of cancers, once they've reached that kind of late stage, it's rare that you're able to say with a high degree of confidence that whatever it is we did, 100% cured it. It's more of to the matter of, well, we, we've gotten it down to a low enough level where it's not going to shorten your life versus whatever else might be going on with you. So the part that you kind of have to accept is it's always there, kind of like a, a goblin. You know, it's, it's a bit of a ghost, and it's the, the boogeyman that's hiding under the bed. It's the thing you don't talk about that always kind of keeps you up at night that you're afraid of. It's always there. And so you have to learn to be vigilant. You have to learn to acknowledge it. You have to learn to be on the lookout for it because as soon as you start believing that you don't have to think about it, that's when it slaps you in the face and you're right back to where you were. So I think, you know, this is, you can keep going with the metaphor and kind of go off into a lot of tangents. But again, I think it's a good framework to just at least start getting your head around what's going on. And then how, how do you start thinking about it in a way that makes it a little more tangible from a solution standpoint? Because if, if we do nothing else today, what I'm hoping we're able to do is give people some actions that are relevant and something they can kind of attach onto to go, okay, I acknowledge the problem. I want to do something. Where do I start? Yeah. Like, what, what do I actually do? Because uh, right now, I, I don't think that's clear. And I, I'm not, by no means do I think I know the right answer. I know an answer that might work for some people so we'll we'll share that and if it helps some people great uh that's that's kind of all you can do i mean this is amazing because it gets my head into a frame of being able to talk about something that's upsetting whether it's cancer or racism and why is it upsetting is for a thousand different reasons as i listen to you the part that i get and it's like oh my just going to have to ride through this. The treatment is going to hurt. The treatment in many ways might feel worse than the initial symptoms. The treatment's going to hurt. That has my attention and I get it. The thing after that is, wait, we're not going to fix it. We're not going to fit. We're not going to solve racism in the same way. No, we will fix things. We will get to a point where we're able to live better than before we were diagnosed perhaps, but the ghost 
will remain and require us to be vigilant. And I'm assuming that that must be very true of someone who's been through cancer. The likelihood of it coming back, I believe, is, is, is that true, is higher? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you got to remain and, vigilant in a way that you had never thought about before. Right. There, there is a monitoring aspect where, you know, you talk to people who have gone into remission. They go visit that oncologist on a regular basis for some period of time for, you know, more scans, more monitoring to, to look for evidence that it hasn't relapsed. This is pretty powerful. So this step three, the treatment's going to hurt. Doctor, I take your word for that. Okay. And even after treatment, it's going to be rough. But the one, as I really reflect on this, Tony, and the conversation we're having now, and was actually this one up here at the front about the scariness of having the conversation, because I think it was interesting in terms of actions. This is on me now. And I know this conversation isn't about me, but I'm going to say it. This is what has affected me. Yeah from the two conversations we've had around this is I said, Hey, you know, we've known each other as long as we have. Why have we never really had the conversation about the fact that I'm white and you're black? And does that matter? And you said something interesting. You said, Dan, you have to initiate it. I didn't know that. It's a scary topic. So I'm just not going to go there. Let's talk about Star Wars instead, because it's more fun. And th what I had failed to realize in what you have shared with kids. Yeah. By virtue of who I am and who you are, just from this, I have to initiate the conversation. Yeah, it, it's um, it, the, there's so many things that that factor into that. I, I would say the the easiest explanation is, regardless of where you and I are individually in our relationship, there is a disparity in the country of white power, black power. And by and large, the, a black person is at higher risk of the reaction to initiating that conversation than the white person is. Yeah, you know, like, like most people who know each other, like us, you know, where one person's black, one person's white, that started out as a professional relationship. We met at work and we got to know each other and then we decided, hey, we're going to carry that relationship outside of work and have remained friends regardless of where we had worked. But at some point, if we have a professional relationship, the risk to the black person at bringing that up is usually much, much higher. And so as a black person, you're often looking for, you know, I, I don't want to call it an invitation. If, if that's a conversation you want to have, you need to let me know that you want to have it. And I am more than happy to, to go there. But we have been conditioned to avoid that topic because most people don't want to have that conversation. And why? Because it's uncomfortable. That, that's the reality is it's just uncomfortable. You know, you hear people say, you know, don't talk about politics, don't talk about religion, you don't talk about race. Because you know? <laughs> it's one of those third rails that it can go sideways so quickly. And you are risking a relationship if you find out that, hey, I now, you know, we end up having a conversation about race. I say something, you say something, and you may never recover from that. Mm -hmm. That's... You know, for either of us, there may be no getting past that thing that gets brought out in that conversation. And the friendship may not be able to withstand that. So it, it takes a real friendship and a history to be able to go there with the full recognition that there are things that both of us may say that make the other person uncomfortable. So it, it is a risk that both people are taking. The black person is usually taking a higher risk, usually, um, maybe always. <laughs> but there is a real risk, and the ramifications can be, can be severe. So that, that is a big part of why, you know, a, as a white person, you have to really be open to initiating initiating that conversation now the thing i would put as a caveat and i hope you know anybody who who would watch this don't just randomly walk up to a black person and say hey i need to learn more about race and i was hoping to take you to lunch one day and i was going to pepper you with a bunch of questions that's just rude 
<laughs> regardless of race relations and friendship. That's just a rude thing to do. You have to invest in a relationship to get to know somebody, to get into that kind of conversation, knowing that it might get a little uncomfortable. So, you know, the, the normal rules of etiquette apply even for this topic. Of everything that we've shared over the last couple of weeks, if I were to thank you for something, it would be for calling my attention to this issue, this fact that I would need to initiate that conversation. And um, so what kind of brought this up a moment ago was you saying, as we talk today, hopefully some things will come out of this conversation that might lead to some actions that someone could take. And here's one that I can feel and would like to share with other people I know. Based on what I've talked about with you, what we're talking about right now, and some other friends that I've spoken to over the last week, when I have shared with them your invitation, that Dan, if you want to have the conversation about race, because we know each other well, and because we have a relationship, I'm happy to go there, but you have to initiate it. That is an action that I can now take, and I have learned something that I did not know before. And that sort of just falls into this first category of even seeing that there's cancer right are you willing to even talk about it you feel ill the other thing i would add tony just and and you said it i don't know how to say this well but if you and i or if anybody has a real relationship a real friendship it ought to be strong enough to be able to withstand the most difficult stuff or else you kind of got to ask what relationship do we really have? I agree. I, I I completely agree. You know, it's it's unfortunate. You and I are old enough. We won't completely date ourselves. <laughs> but, you know, we we existed and grew up in a time pre Facebook and LinkedIn and, you know, social networks where we have we have cheapened the term friend. As being mm, oh. anyone, anybody who I have met or would like to meet, I'm going to put all those people in the same bucket and give them the same classification. And it 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 really, I think, cheapens the term because the the reality is, I don't care who you are and how many people you know and how many connections you have on LinkedIn or how many people follow you on Twitter. In reality, you're lucky if you've got four or five friends. Yeah, I mean that that's just the reality. One of one of my good friends told me, you know, he said that your your friend is the person when you wake up in a foreign prison and you don't know how you got there, the person you call is your friend. <laughs> and, but it it you start realizing, you know, there are things you share with somebody who is a true friend. There are things you're comfortable asking there. You know, it's when the phone rings in the middle of the night, it's the, you know, you don't, if you see who it is and it's one of those people, your first thought is this person is in trouble. And your first response isn't, why are you calling me? Mm. It's how can I help? That's your instinct. And, you know, again, I I think so I I would just say as a cautionary tale to to anyone, if you're thinking about, you know, diving down in this this area with somebody and really, you know, having a meaningful conversation, it needs to be with somebody on that short list. And I would also say if you are looking at that short list and there's nobody on it who doesn't look like you and have your same background then that's instructive too. <laughs> that That's something that you should look at and say, you know, how is it that I don't know so many of these things that are happening? Well, it's because everybody in your immediate circle is just like you. And so how would you? That's a pretty good thing to think about too. Well, and, and just it's leading me to one little thought that's hard for me to grab onto, but if you look at your list of the four or five, six friends that are real, that are the person who, when they call, you'd pick up the phone regardless of the time, and there's nobody there who's different than you in any meaningful way, it's not just instructive. It is instructive. It's, it's, it's kind of a call to action. 
Like you might want to get someone on that list, and that's not somebody. Oh, I'll I'll call the black guy I know. You know, it's it's right. it that that I'm hearing that as you might want to rethink some of your own choices, and not in any judgmental way, but things might be a little more limited than they could be if that's the truth. Well, if nothing else, you need to come to grips with the fact you may not be as broad a person as you think you are. And that's just a, a realization that all of us have to come to grips with at some point in our lives. We all like to think of ourselves as being smarter, better looking, you know, in better condition than we, than we really are. I, that's that's <laughs> we 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 all do that, but you know it, it, when you really look at who are the people I associate with, are they all just like me? And if that's true, you know there, there are gaps in your knowledge, there are gaps in your experience, and it makes it very hard to to solve or even engage in problem solving for a lot of issues that we grapple with today because I don't have anybody close to me, so I can't have meaningful conversations about some of those topics. One of the best things I ever read in a book, I think it was one on the history of God. Hmm. And it, it, it made such a great point up front about why is religion such a difficult topic. And his point was, for the religion that is your religion, you have a PhD because you've grown up with it and you just know it inside and out. But for another religion that you're arguing against or putting down, you have about a third grade education. And we do that. Race is another one of those things where we tell ourselves, oh, I have a very good understanding. I am worldly. I have black friends, I have black colleagues, so I therefore know a lot about race. In most cases, most white people really have never had to get into some of the darker areas of race and race relations and racism. So you really just don't know as much as you would like to believe you know. And so again, you can't even get to problem solving if you haven't gotten through that acknowledgement that there's even a thing there and a problem that is worthy of attention and that that, a prob that problem is affecting you too. There, there may be, it may be affecting other people more, but it's affecting you too. And so that, again, get a friend. Uh, I, I actually heard uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar has been interviewed a million times over the past few weeks. And one of the interviewers asked him at the end, if you could give advice to people to do one thing right now, what would it be? And he just said, go make a friend with somebody who's not like you. And I, I think that's a really wise thing for a lot of reasons, this being one of them. That's pretty powerful. Yeah. And simple. We've kind of gone back to that opening phase of the discussion of the symptoms, we're moving beyond that, recognizing that it's metastasized. It's not in just one organ anymore. And when you think about George Floyd and you think about the events of the last couple of weeks, and you think about this step three here of treatment, chemo, expand on that a little bit more to the degree that you can. Are we at the point where we need to start treatment in a way we haven't? What might that mean? Yeah, I, I, it's a really good question yeah. to kind of, you know, the, the value of any process flow or framework. Anytime you see chevrons, it's, you know, a, a problem with con old consultants is we see the world in chevrons and stages and phases. But it does have value in that, like any roadmap, it lets you know where, where are we. You know, where in, in the worst thing you can do in, in a process is jump ahead before you're ready to get there. You know, if I were to say, where are we right now? I literally believe we have just gotten, as a society, we're about here. Okay. We, we are, we've seen it, 
and we're finally starting to acknowledge it mm. in a meaningful way to the to the point where we acknowledge it enough that we're actually talking about what what should we do and what can we do in a way that I don't think we have uh, maybe ever it, at least not in in our lifetimes you know I'm sure there have been other you know post civil war pre civil war there were plenty of discussions about what should we be doing but th this is one of the certainly first times in a long time that you know to be blunt that a large population of white people have seen it and been outraged and have said we need to do something now that's not enough but if you don't get that part right you can't move on I and mean, this is what we talked about before the the thing that has stunted progress so many times in the past is you run up against denial and you know the, again this is true whether you're talking about cancer any kind of condition or you're talking about racism because you know you can think about racism as, as a if you think about society as the 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 system or the body and so when you start talking about the denial you just can't get past that and we have been stuck there for decades if not centuries where we just refuse to we being society meaning white people have really refused to acknowledge what what's really happening and what we're seeing I mean, you and i talked about this before you know what what brought us what's changed this time that wasn't there before and largely i, I think it's cell phone video i i think cell phone video has been that you know that that imagery that that we have finally got that has taken this powerful tool being the tool of an image we, we've taken something that was a powerful tool out of the hands of a very small group of people who were photojournalists and we have now made it ubiquitous so and we made it video so it, it is a more powerful tool and it is even more powerful because of its ubiquity and that everybody has it so we see more and all of a sudden all these things that you've heard about that we could dismiss we could make excuses for we could blame the victim all of a sudden now you see it on video and it's really hard to walk away from it yeah. and make up an excuse and that's what i think is getting us past the traditional denial you know it's so funny given your background as well among other jobs that you had as we talked about working at phillips healthcare where i remember what 10 years ago doing a project with you something like that where you were uh, talking about um, clarifying the use of very sophisticated types of, sophisticated types of medical imaging devices yeah. uh, as a way to diagnose well isn't it ironic profoundly that what you've just said is what's different this time is we have better imaging devices it Yes. Cell phones are seeing into the brain of society in the way, and this is a stretch, but I want to go there because I think it's interesting. The imaging side, I'm just talking, Tell you were the one who came up with the idea. What what was, make the connection for us. No, I, I think you, you actually articulated it really well yourself, which is, you know, if images from, you know, healthcare, is just the improvement in our ability to see things that we couldn't see before with the clarity and an ability to measure it very precisely and then it makes the treatment so much more effective because you are not just you're not just providing a treatment for something that you know is there but you're measuring something far downstream like a biomarker or blood pressure or something like that to actually be able to see the root cause of something and draw borders around it and measure it and then you can start attacking it and you can always keep going back with that that measuring tool that image 
to say, am I fixing it? Am I improving it? Is it getting smaller? What What is actually happening over time? Mm-hmm. And so to your point, I think the the ubiquity of, of cell phone cameras provide a layer of monitoring that we haven't had before. You know, specifically when you're looking at the George Floyd situation, you know, just within the past couple of days, you're just seeing police forces all over the country making body cam video mandatory. That's good for everybody. It's good for police. It's good for the public. That is good because it is providing a video image record of an interaction. And that just gives us visibility into what are inherently difficult situations. And so our ability to see that and our ability to see more of it is is a good thing. And again, it, it makes the treatment more targeted. It makes it more meaningful because we don't end up wasting so much time in the, well, I'm not really sure that's what happened, or he said, she said, so we'll never really know, and we never actually get past the denial. That, that I think, is, has, has always been the biggest barrier. And you see it also in cancer is one of those things where our, our natural instinct is to deny something that is scary, as we talked about earlier. Scary things are not things you run towards. It's things you run away from. And the power of an image in healthcare is you see it. You know, everybody sees it. It's there. Now what? What we've just identified, Tony, is yeah. imaging, and I'm trying to draw a little bit of a CT scanner here. Yep. yep. Uh, is a great tool to make sure you're not in denial. Hey, look, I've looked inside your body. I've seen these images. They show me unequivocally the disease. Now we're going to treat there, there's it. A, right. There, there is a fact base to an image that makes it very hard to escape and deny. And, and, and in the treatment of cancer, I'm assuming you come back to some version of that imaging machine at each step along the way to validate. Is, is that true? Are you like going back yeah. and recalibrating? Uh, more, more often than not, you know, it, it is a measurement device. Okay. So you're using it to assess, you know, it's the way you determine is the treatment doing what it's supposed to do. So is it shrinking a tumor? Is it, you know, maybe again, when you're talking about something that's systemic, uh, now I am looking at other factors, but I'm trying to make sure, you know, that your heart is still functioning correctly. Your lungs are still working well, your kidneys are working. And I, I will often use, use imaging, some kind of imaging technology to, to measure those effects and make sure things are working the way we need them to. And I can use that as a proxy to at least say, well, before we did the treatment, this is what it looked like. After the treatment, it now looks like this. Therefore, I can assume we are heading in a better direction and the treatment is is doing what we need it to do. So kind of falling in love with our metaphor here. It serves the purpose of making a difficult conversation somewhat easier to have. It gives guidance around that conversation. And there's the kind of the insightful serendipity moment of saying, oh, I just discovered something from this uh, from cancer that might be relevant to thinking about racism. And this is images. I know we have some images. This is a little bit of a shift that we wanted no, to, to talk about. So before I start showing pictures, why did you why did we why did you want to go down this route of showing some images. I would love, I love to show pictures because of their power, but we're going to show some images that are both disturbing and, and wonderful. And what's our intent here, Tony, in your, in your yeah, I, I No, I, good, good question. And I think it's, for me, it's, it's at least twofold. One, exactly what you just said. Images are powerful. We remember them. They have an impact. There is a story or oftentimes a perspective that has been missing and it fills in a gap. So I I find them to be extraordinarily powerful for all the reasons that we all gravitate toward them uh, for that reason. And then the the other reason is largely what we've kind of already covered. It it, it makes denial harder. You know, it, it fills in a blank where it's sort of, you know, how many times have we heard somebody saying, well, I've never seen that before. And if I've never seen it, it doesn't exist. 
an image all of a sudden you see it and some part of your brain goes okay i may need to readjust my thinking so the thinking about this image yeah i you know this is from uh 68 mm -hmm. 1968 yep. apollo 8 8 yep. thank you so this was you know the first shot taken over the over the with the moon in view. We have other pictures from space of Earth that go all the way back, I think, to the late fifties. But this was the first time we actually saw the moon as basically home, and over the horizon we saw the Earth and its perspective. And this was just the the perspective of our own planet and our place in a broader solar system that I thought, you know, it, for all the reasons that it, it persists as such a powerful image today, is it is a perspective that up until that exact moment in time, we had never had before. And it's amazing what, you know, everything that comes with that is just this, this one single picture that had never been seen before by anybody on Earth and everything that gets attached to that on a grand scale all the way down to an individual scale just by one picture and i i think that's a that that is the power of an image the power of an image so let's let's take an image which is nowhere near so, like that one yeah yeah so, so we should warn people if you're looking at this that this can be uncomfortable to look at yeah we're yeah i think that's fair thank you tony yeah. for initiating that too for I don't want to do disclaimers and stuff like that, but normally I try to keep everything on Napkin Academy very abundant and positive and moving forward. Just the nature sure. of where we are right now, I think it's fair to go maybe slightly down a different path just in the acknowledgement of everything we're talking about. So um, yeah. this is an image. I don't know how clear it is to people what we're looking at. Do you know the date on this image? This one is um, 19. So 1900, yep. but I want to say it's like 1920s or 1930s. I believe that's the case. But yeah, what, what you're seeing here, if you're not clear on it yet, is that this is a lynching, that this is a, a photograph of a bunch of people gathered in a field where a black man has been lynched. And you, if you see kind of right in the center of the frame, he's hanging from the tree couple of things that I think are, are noteworthy about the picture, aside from just the, the gruesome reality of it, is the casualness of the people standing around. You've got children who are there. There's, there's nothing abnormal. It probably isn't the first time that most of these things, you, know, you don't want to read too much into a single image. But think for a second about what, what is the mindset of a group of people who would do this and then tell somebody else that they did it and then go bring their children to come see. And this is our history. This is the history of our country, just like the, the glory days of the space race and every other part of our history that we, we glamorize. And rightfully so, uh, this is the other part that we don't talk about that hurts us because we have, we have erased a lot of this from our history. And by erasing it, we have pushed it down to a point of not acknowledging it. And we have to acknowledge it. You have to acknowledge that this is what was typical. These, these were, this is not the only photo of a lynching mm -hmm. that you can find. And the numbers, I, there's a museum that opened, I want to say it's either in Birmingham or Montgomery, Alabama, or it might be in Mississippi, that is a memorial to all the victims that we know of who were lynched, it's a long, long list. It is a long list. Again, we don't talk about this, and I know why. I mean, who would want to talk about something that is this uncomfortable? But this is our history. And, you know, one, one of the things that I think, you know, should be a theme when you talk about actions, you know, what, what is the value of talking about this beyond just talking about it? And I, you asked it up front, is what, what do we do? You know, what does any individual do? What does a group do? What do two friends do? 
one is education. You, you have to educate yourself about our history as a country. And it means opening some doors that we have fought very hard to close uh, within our own history. And again, if you don't acknowledge it, you don't see it, you don't understand it, it's very, very hard to get into problem solving mode. And I'm not saying everybody needs to go take a class on the history of racism or pick up every big, thick tome that's ever been written. But there are some things, and we'll talk about it before we end. What is just a short list of resources and references that a person can turn to that, you know, everything from some very short videos to some essays to books for those who really want to dig in. But there, there is an educational aspect of this that can't be ignored where we've got to open up some doors in our own history and acknowledge who we are as a, as a country. That's going to allow us to move forward uh, in a way that I don't think anything else will. Because if I keep telling you things that happen and in your mind you're going, yeah, I think you're exaggerating, then we're never really going to come to grips with some of the, the painful solutions that we have to, we have to dig into. Well, I'm glad you shared this with me. We throw it, we, we, we put it up on the screen. We look at it. We talk about it. And it's real disturbing. There's no question, Tony. I, It's a struggle just to get into the mindset. And, you know, it is our history. And what I also find super compelling about this, back to our analogy, is the images make the denial harder. And yeah. I think what my impression is with George Floyd video is the image which is the power of this photograph times a thousand because it's in real time it's a video you can hear you can sense if we are on the on the Chevron chart where you had indicated we are and it seems about right to me or we're right about here as you pointed out that seems like the power of these images making sense on now is the time to acknowledge. And it feels to me, based on the conversations I've had, which are limited over the last 10 days, that there is an acknowledgement among people who I talk to that is broader and deeper and more universal than there had been after Ferguson or other types of events. Yeah. Now, the, the other thing that is, it's interesting how things happen historically and overlap and affect each other just from a timing perspective. If not for the fact that we are going through this lockdown period around COVID-19, this moment in time where the George Floyd incident was provided time and space that it otherwise never would have had. If this had happened a year ago, it would have gotten a lot of attention. It definitely would have sparked protests in Minneapolis, but eventually Monday would come and everybody would go back to work. And the fact that that didn't happen this time, because this moment was allowed time and space that it never would have otherwise had, and it's allowed the attention to remain. That has really forced a lot of the change that we never saw before. Yes, the video was the catalyst and the precipitating event that made it ubiquitous for everybody to see. Would we have seen protests in London or in Seoul if not for the fact that we had the video and we had the time and space where people said, I, I don't have anything else more pressing to do and this matters. It's one of those odd things about how history works. Tony, let's go to things we can do. Let's go to your list yeah. of resources. Yeah, I, I think there are, again, I'm not under any illusion that that this is something that, that is easy to, to grapple with. I'm not under any illusion that it's not painful. We've talked about that. The pain is part of it. Change requires pain. That's, there's no way of avoiding that. But education does provide some context and some starting points. And if nothing else, 
if you can educate yourself, it's a good starting point to invest some in your own education. One of the things, or one of the, let me just pull up a pin here. One of the things that I think has been uh, just a great resource is a speech by Martin Luther King. This may be the first time a lot of people have even heard about this. It is not the 1964 I Have a Dream speech. He actually gave a number of fascinating speeches. One is titled The Other America. What's fascinating about this speech, it's from 1967. It's on YouTube. You can pull it up. It's the MLK, The Other America. If you ignore a couple of references in the 40-minute speech, you would swear he gave it yesterday. It is it is so relevant. And so many of the arguments that he makes and the points he brings out, we're hearing a lot of those things today. So I find it to be a, a great opportunity. It's also interesting because it's the a, a number of people who study Martin Luther King and black history will point out that the 1963, 1964 Martin Luther King, they often call the optimistic, happy King. The 1967, 68 version, they call the angry King. And Martin Luther King is always an optimistic person. He was always very much an advocate of nonviolence, but it's interesting to see how his thinking and his perspective and attitude evolved over time. Um, as he got a little older and after the civil rights bill, uh, main legislation of that was signed in the early mid sixties and how he still saw a lot of these problems evolving and changing color, so to speak. And the 67, this speech is really just a really good view into how his thinking had evolved after the I Have a Dream period. The other one that I would encourage people to read is uh, New York Times Magazine did a wonderful series of essays last year, 1919, on um, what was called the uh, 1619 Project. So it was the 400th 1619 project. Uh, what's the, the relevance of 1619, if people don't know that, is it is the date when slaves were first brought to the U.S. And so last year, 2019, was the 400th anniversary of that event. And uh, they're just a powerful collection of essays, but they also do a really nice job talking about our history, something that may be very jarring for people to, to learn is the the use of uh, many of the records that southern plantation owners kept around how to get more productivity out of their slaves that a lot of that documentation uh, was borrowed by the nazis in world war ii um, again it, going back to what we said earlier we we don't know our own history and we probably know more about Nazi Germany, given all the documentaries and all the books and all the parts that are taught about the Nazis and all the horrible things that they did. And to think that some of the things that they did were borrowed from us, from our country and our history, uh, is something we need to know. I didn't know that. You know, they, they didn't create all of that. They took it to another level, but so did we. And we kept meticulous records about it. So it was there was a record of it that somebody else could then take and take to another level several years later or several decades later. So excellent series of essays. There's another well, white paper that most people probably are not familiar with. It's called The White Space. Uh, it's by a gentleman named Elijah... Elijah Anderson, uh, he's a professor of sociology at Yale. It, it is, I, I think, required reading for black people and white people in just really breaking down the, the fact that, that there are multiple spaces that we live in. And for most white people, they spend their entire life in their space. 
And so every interaction that they have with a person of color or someone who is different is occurring in their space. And they are not aware of that. And that the person of color they're dealing with has actually made a journey into your space. And that's where we're interacting. But I know in my head as a person of color that my access to that space is provisional. And I'm using his words. And I, I think that is such a, a powerful term to, to think about the fact that our society is actually carved up into these spaces. And a lot of times you're interacting with somebody who knows that their ability to be in that space in that moment in time could be taken away from them. And it changes how you act. It wow. changes how you react. It changes, going back to what we said earlier, think about the knowledge that a black person has of believing I am interacting with a white person, but my status in this space or my ability to even come into this space could be taken away. And therefore, how willing am I to have a serious conversation about race? So it, it sort of gets back to, to that point. Um, Tony, because, I would say, because sometimes I, you know, um, like to get knocked over the head, you know, hear it loudly. That is part of what you were referring to where we kicked this off with. If you and I are going to have a conversation about race and what does it mean, it's going to need to start from me. Yeah, got it. because I, I have to know that that we I have to know that you're open to it, because I also know if the conversation is going to be meaningful going back to what we've said before, it, it may hurt a little. It may hurt a lot. And so I'm reluctant to go down that path if I don't think you're really open to to, to hearing what my answers are going to be. I mean, I could give you happy answers to make you feel better, but then it's a meaningless conversation. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing to, I, I would recommend anybody, read anything by James Baldwin. James Baldwin is just a fascinating author who has an insight into the psyche of America in a way that I think few writers ever had. And I, I think in some cases, he understands white people better than white people do. And I think his insights into why white people react or act in certain situations is just incredibly insightful. For, for black and white readers, anything James Baldwin's ever written, I think, is, uh, is worth reading. Then another one which somebody recommended to me that I just got, and I have not, I actually have not read this, but I have, it comes well recommended. It's a book called Race and Reunion by uh, what, David Blight. And this is by Anderson. This really looks at the period around the Civil War and talks about the role of, of race, uh, specifically around the Civil War and how that story has been shaped over time. Again, this is one of those parts of learning about our own history that doesn't get talked about. I don't think most of us, if you think about what you learned back in high school or maybe even in college about the Civil War and how the story has been shifted where the war was about slavery and anybody who really bothers to to read about it knows that but because of the way we ended the war we allowed it to be reframed and of course given that people reframed it and what it was what is it has become reframed as is it was a battle over states rights Slavery was a minor issue, but the real fight was about states' rights. Now, why would we reframe it, or why would people reframe it that way? Uh, because it made it noble. It basically took something that was secession over a, a heinous act of slavery and now turned it into, it was really a battle of perspective about where federal versus states' rights and that made it a noble pursuit. And so what it has allowed is the persistence of a way of thinking and a way of life in large parts of our country 
that have never really had to come with come, come to grips with the fact what were what was the war really about and the fact that you were defeated the south was defeated and yet we we basically said just go home if you look at the history of civil wars i'm pretty sure our civil war may be one of the few if not the only situations where the losing side just got to go home. Usually they get hung, they get enslaved, they get put in prison, they, they don't get to go home. And in our case, for the good of the larger union, Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses Grant basically offered extremely generous terms and said, okay, yes, we were fighting each other and killing each other yesterday, but just go home. Take your guns, take your horses, go home. By doing that, a lot of historians would argue, and I think they make a great point, the South has never had to come to grips with the loss of the Civil War. And in fact, we're able to reclaim it and reframe it and rewrite it as a noble pursuit of states' rights and the slavery issue has been pushed down. I heard yesterday from somebody else talking that by the end of the Civil War, the number of black soldiers fighting for the Union were greater than the white soldiers fighting for the Confederacy. I, I was blown no away idea. by that no stat, idea. that there were that many black people fighting for the Union. I mean, that, that is a massive number of people. And that stat has just been completely taken out to the point where the role of black people in the Civil War has just been erased. And so again, it, the whole story has been reframed and, and retaught. I mean, it's why there are statues of Robert E. Lee and other Civil War names that we know littered throughout the South. That doesn't happen anywhere else. If you, if you start a civil war and you lose, you don't get monuments. That's, just, that's kind of a basic rule 101 of losing a civil war. And yet here, we've, we've treated it like, well, it was a dispute, we fought, we made up, and there were great people on, on all sides. So again, it's part of our history. We need to better understand it because it, it's all these pieces where we, I, I realize the gaps that I have and how it's very hard to put some of these conversations within context because we're missing really important parts of our own history. And until you start filling in some of those blanks, now all of a sudden the conversation of racism in today's society, you start to see patterns you start to see conscious decisions that groups made that led to where we are and you know how how did we get to a point where our relationship with our police mm -hmm. are you know is where it is it wasn't an accident it was by design in the sense that we kept we kept wanting these segregated spaces and by we i mean actually white people that that's a great example i i use the term we but in reality white people have constantly looked for ways to segregate. The police were there to protect the line. That was the role of police, is keep them there and protect us here. And so it's not surprising when you then see how police interact with black communities, they're playing out the role that they were designed for from from you know very early in the founding of cities and our, our the structure the government structure we have now so again is it shocking that there's this antagonistic position between our police and, and communities of color not really because the role of the police was keep you here and all your problems i want to keep you here so Again, I, I'm a big fan of education. I, I just I think it's hard to grapple with big problems like this without without some facts. Our our facts are spotty when it comes to race, 
And so hopefully, you know, whether your thing is watching a video, reading an essay, or you, you know, want to read a book, there's some, some meat there that you can kind of dig into. And just to start filling in some of the gaps that I think can be very helpful at thinking about what happens next or what to do. Tony, thank you. I want to add one more thought just on the last thing that you were sharing about the role of the police. Um, one of the things we may or may not have ever really talked about in detail in our in our years of knowing each other is um, my father was in the Air Force and I was a Boy Scout. And at the time when I was growing up and where I was growing up, those were great things, great, great things. And one of the things that from George Floyd, from the other perspective, is who's doing it. And I would I don't know how this all adds into all of the math that we're talking about, all the different pieces here. But one of the things that was doubly difficult is seeing the guy in uniform. For me as a white guy who grew up respecting, and it was, the man in uniform is worthy of respect. This is a person who's yeah. putting their life on the line to protect law and order and rules and society. And that was the truth in which I grew up. That's what I saw. And to see that flipped around and an undeniably in this, and that's why I think George Floyd is the video that it is. What it shows, the time in which it's shown, and the man in uniform looking at the camera, effectively saying, yeah, I'm doing this. I can't do the math in my mind to how that's even possible, which is the additional layer of reflection and just I don't even know where to go with that. I'm believing things and seeing things that I have been hesitant about in the past. It's right there in front of me. I did want to thank you for all your time. Let's close on, I think, our analogy here. Uh, Tony, uh, bring it home for us. How would you like to close this out? You know, I, again, the, the biggest challenge when you, when, when we're grappling with a big problem is to, to try to boil the ocean and get overwhelmed. And I, I go back to something that Martin Luther King actually talked about in that Other America speech, where he said, a lot of people will tell him, you'll never get rid of racism until you change the hearts and minds of people, and that'll take hundreds of years. And he said, I agree with that, but in the near term, we can fix legislation. We can fix policy. We can fix organizational problems, and we have to. So I, I can change immediate behaviors, even if the underlying attitudes and beliefs still persist. Yeah. We can't allow a, a long-standing attitude or belief to continue to be played out on a daily basis against a group of people who have suffered enough. So I would say to anybody, don't try to boil the ocean and feel like if you can't get your, your racist uncle to like black people, that it somehow that's a failure. That may never happen and don't worry about that focus on policies focus on uh, laws focus on organizational structures that maintain the racist past that we have and at least take the burden off of the people being oppressed and in time you change the behavior the attitudes and beliefs may hopefully follow at some point in the future but focus on behavior that's where i that's where i'd end it focus on behavior so i'll take that as the next thing to do is look at myself that's a that's always a good place to start yeah tony thank you